morning. Can you hear me? Good morning. Welcome, welcome to the Debussy Theatre uh, on this Saturday morning. Thank you for getting up so bright and early to join us here today. It's the last day of the festival, but we've got some... Oh, my photo taken. Hi. Um, oh, and you as well. Hi. Uh, so, yeah, we've got some fantastic speakers lined up today. Today's a little bit different. Um, today, we felt that you'd probably seen lots of trend presentations and data versus creativity discussions, and it was time for some, a bit of a change. And so today is all about the people who work in the industry. We kind of loosely titled it, We Are The Creatives, because they are the creatives, and you are the creatives, and we're all creatives, and we're all part of the same community. And this is a chance to hear from some people within that community to tell lots of really genuinely fascinating stories. Have your hankies at the ready during the day. I expect there to be lots of emotion in the room, and that's fine. A um, couple of housekeeping things, though, because we have to do those. Okay, so our final award show tonight begins at 7 p.m. Has anyone here not been to an award show? Yeah, you've not been. Okay, if you've not been, tonight is the one to go to. It's the big one. It's got film, it's got the special awards, it's got the big holding company awards. It's really a real kind, it's a big show. Um, it's very popular. Make sure you get an early spot in the queue to guarantee getting a seat. That starts at seven. I would start arriving at 6.15 to guarantee entry into the theatre. Once it's full, we stream it in here though, so everyone who wants to see it will get to see it. Straight after the award show, it's the Canline Closing Party! Yeah. Woo! Yeah. There's gonna be lots of moments like this throughout the day, so the quicker you get on board with it, the quicker we get through. Um, it's the Canline Closing Party. Did everyone come to the opening party? Yes, did you enjoy that? Okay, if you enjoyed the opening party, I can promise you the closing party is gonna be at least 50 billion times better, right? And that's a personal guarantee from me. Um, we've got live acts, we've got champagne, we've got food, we've got it all until two in the morning, so don't miss that. Um, and, and, and I'll be there, so it's gonna be great. <laughs> okay, so back on to our first speaker. Um, I said some of the stories you hear today will make you laugh and make you cry and some are going to make you gasp in wonder and some might shock you and some might tease you. Um, and we're starting with something um, very personal. Um, it's my absolute pleasure for me to introduce our first storyteller for the day. He's here to share his story about how advertising actually saved his film and his sanity. Please give him a very warm Saturday morning can lies welcome to the USA Chief Creative Officer from McGarry Bowen, Ned Crowley! Hi, Lenny. Sorry about your loss. Look for me on television. Please don't talk about me when I'm gone. Pretty baby, don't bother me. Today, I've been given another chance, and I know exactly what I have to do. Out of the guard there, pilgrim. I am a stand-up comedian. You ain't no stand-up. Not yet, but I'm on my way to Las Vegas for the Monty Guy auditions. Was I a speeding officer? <laughs> hey, how about you open for me? <laughs> <laughs> Destiny's call. It's time to get up there and shake your stuff. Welcome to the stage, Lenny Freeman. Get off the stage. You suck. You could be my manager, Hitch. I don't enter into contracts lightly. Now, please, stop me if you heard this one before. I can't go right now. Doesn't surprise me. Nobody ever leaves this place. What seems to be troubling you? I have never been in trouble. And now I'm in the worst kind of trouble ever. No, you ain't, Lenny. Yes, Lenny. I am, Hitch. No, you ain't, Lenny. Now you are. Open the truck! There's only one way on our contract. This is insane! Do it! Look at me, I'm busting a gut. Morning, everybody. Hi, thank you. 
Love the smell of rosé in the morning. Thank you. Um, it's great to be here. Um, uh, it's a good-sized crowd. I was, part of me was a little worried nobody would be here, and um, the other part of me was sort of hoping nobody would be here. But, um, but that aside, um, welcome. I know it's early, so thank you for coming out. Um, I'm going to get right into it. Um, welcome to a, uh, a bloody mess, how uh, advertising saved my movie and my sanity. Uh, my name is Ned Crowley. I am the U.S. Chief Creative Officer of McGarry Bowen. More importantly, I am the idiot who thought he could take a four-month sabbatical, go shoot a feature film, and everything would be fine, which it wasn't. Um, that was the trailer for Middleman, the film I wrote and directed and went out to shoot. Um, that'll kind of be the backdrop of today's discussion. Middleman is the story of Lenny Freeman. Um, Lenny is an accountant who quits his job to pursue his lifelong dream of becoming a stand-up comedian. Uh, the problem is he's not funny. And on the road to Vegas, he picks up a hitchhiker, gets caught up in a killing spree, and as the bodies sort of pile up in his trunk, um, he becomes funnier and funnier. So a nice happy topic for this beautiful Saturday morning. Um, before we get too far into it, uh, here's a question for everybody. Who here is secretly working on a screenplay? Come on, come on. All right, and who here is lying about secretly working on a screenplay? Yeah, a lot of people writing screenplays, okay. Um, I have to apologize, if you've come here hoping to learn the art of breaking into Hollywood and having your film produced, this may not be the seminar for you because I'm not sure I'm any closer to figuring any of that out um, uh, at all after even after everything I've been through. But if you've come here because you secretly like to hear stories about the sufferings of other people and you find that funny, well then this is definitely the place for you because that's really what this is about. This is about how I put myself through a, uh, an incredibly terrifying and uncomfortable situation during a time of great turmoil back at my office and actually live to tell about it. So what I, what I thought I would do is take you through some of the highs and lows of that experience and sort of frame it up in, 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 in a way that showed how um, 30 years of lessons I learned in advertising kind of helped me get through that period of time. It actually made for a better movie. It made me a better leader. And um, it actually taught me the importance of, um, of attempting to do something terrifying um, in, uh, in your life. Uh, if there's any theme for today, that's sort of the takeaway, is, uh, is uh, the importance of doing something terrifying. Um, so with that, I'm, I'm going to get right into it. Uh, we've got a short period of time to say, so I'm going to kind of roll right through this. Uh, first off, first stop, why a movie? Why even a movie? Um, well, when I started in advertising in my 20s, um, 100 years ago, uh, I, um, I, I always liked to have a, a, a side project going on uh, while I was working. I always wanted a creative side project going on. I was a big believer in that, and I still am. Uh, in my agency, I encourage that. A lot of people think that's a distraction. I actually think that helps fuel creativity. So in the 80s and the 90s, I had like a performance group um, um, in Chicago, and that's where I'm from, and that's where I, I live today. And, um, and we would write and put up uh, sketch comedy shows and stage shows, and it was really gratifying. And when that kind of, uh, when that kind of wound down, I turned to screenwriting for a couple of reasons. One, um, I still wanted to have something that I could do on the side, you know, from a creative standpoint. And two, it didn't, it didn't require anybody. It was something I could do all by myself, you know. So, um, so I know there's been like thousands and thousands of books written uh, about screenwriting and how to write screenplays and everything. And just for the sake of, of, of today and to level the playing field, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about screenwriting in one simple slide, okay? And it goes like this. Act one, Get your hero stuck in a tree. Act two, throw rocks at him. Act three, get him down. Simple as that. Now you know as much as everybody in Hollywood as far as I'm concerned. Um, and I drew those, by the way. So all you art directors are on notice. Um, yes, yes. Um, so anyway, I had a bunch of screenplays shoved in the drawer, wasn't really doing anything for it, and, um, and things at work seemed to be going pretty well. As I said, I, I was running, I had founded McCary Bow in Chicago, and, um, and uh, things had gone from about, uh, we had gone from two employees to 200, we went from one client to 16, and this was about eight years on, uh, things seemed to be going about as smoothly as things get in advertising, and I thought maybe this was a good time for me to take some time off and do something for myself. Now, I also had a couple of friends in production who I'd worked with over the years who had just formed a production company, and, um, 
and they had uh, filming, a, filming a feature film, um, you know, shooting a feature film on their bucket list. So the three of us got together and we said, hey, why don't, let's figure a way, let's do this. Let's figure a way to do this. And we knew if we were gonna do this, we weren't gonna get any help from Hollywood. I don't know any of you guys who raised your hands, if you send your material around in Hollywood, you know what I'm talking about. Nobody in Hollywood can help you do anything. Nobody will ever come to the table. Nobody, um, I like to say Hollywood is the land of soft yeses, okay? Um, nobody commits to anything, nobody will tell you if they read your screenplay, nobody pass around, nobody's gonna get you any money. Um, so we knew we were gonna have to do this on our own, which was fine, but we knew then the first step was gonna be raising money um, on, on our own. Um, now I was willing to fund, um, to put my own money in, but I didn't wanna fund the whole project at the risk of sending all three of my daughters to trade school, which was an option for a short period of time till I talked to my wife about that, and then that was sort of, you know, we put the kibosh on that. So, um, so we, turned to, um, we turned to Kickstarter. Now, has anybody here ever done Kickstarter? Anybody done a Kickstarter? Kickstarter is an amazing tool. It's an amazing way to raise money, but more importantly, raise a group of supporters to kind of support your project. But be warned, if you're ever gonna do it, it is a ton of work. I had no idea how much work it was going to be. Um, because basically, you're offering all these incentives for people to give you your money. So for us, you know, we're offering for $25, I, we promise you a t-shirt, and then for $50, you get a t-shirt and a poster, and then a t-shirt poster and a DVD, and so on and so forth, which is all great, but what happened was my life quickly became this sort of nonstop, surreal, 24-hour work experience, where by day, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still going to the office, and I'm trying to make the work better, and I'm meeting with, you know, CEOs and captains of industry, and I'm trying to be an important advertising person, right? And then by night, I go home, and I open up my personal email, and I get about a bunch of emails from Kickstarter supporters that basically go like this, hey, where's my t-shirt, asshole? Okay? So, you know, so that was kind of thing. But the, the important thing was we were, able to, um, we were able to raise enough money to make a low-budget film, and it was actually categorized as an ultra-low-budget film. And when I say ultra-low-budget, I mean ultra-low. So, so there's a bunch of producers probably here. Just imagine what you would normally spend for a one-day average commercial production, a one-day production. That's what we had for a 15-day film shoot with four pickup days on both sides, post-production, special effects, catering, everything all in, everything. So no money whatsoever, which is why while um, you and my fellow advertising friends were busy living large on the client at the lovely shutters on the beach in Santa Monica, I'm staying in a one-room, roach-infested, crappy B&B in Sherman Oaks so we can make this, this film. And this is how bad it was. This was the only lamp that was in the entire place, all right? It was the only lamp I had. And this is what it did every time I turned it on. Morning, noon, night. That's all we had. But look, like I said, the, <laughs> yeah, I'm not kidding. That's, that's what it was. Um, the important thing was that we had raised enough, enough money um, to make this feature, and um, we just had enough. Um, the other important thing was that I had the support of my agency. I had the support of my agency back home. I had the support, actually I had the support of my clients who were really behind me, thought it was a great idea. But most important, I had the support of my co-partner and president of the Chicago office at the time who promised me and committed that even though his contract was up, that he would not go anywhere while I was gone because we both agreed that would be a disaster if all the leadership was gone during that time period. So I had his commitment, I had no more excuses, and I'm like, okay, time to go, right? So I get in my Jeep, we're gonna, I'm getting into my Jeep, I'm gonna drive my car out there because I need a car while I'm out there. And um, it's great because the route I'm taking from Chicago to LA, it's the same um, road that the character in the film takes. So it's kind of fun and I, I packed up and I got my road tunes, you know, and I've got my espresso machine and, and my passenger seat, you know, and I'm just driving and thinking and drinking espresso for three days and it's awesome. And I go through the farmlands of the Midwest and then we go through the mountains and then, um, and then we go through, the, uh, we go through the, um, the deserts and then finally I get to California. And I'll never forget this. So I roll into California and I actually see the Hollywood sign. I've seen it a million times, but I see, roll up and we see the Hollywood sign. And I think to myself, this is really gonna happen. I mean, I've never taken, I've never even taken two weeks off in a row for vacation. And I've got this four months ahead of me and we're gonna make this film and this production is gonna go ahead and I feel like I'm on top of the world, right? 
And that's when I got this text from my co-partner and president. And that is the exact moment when I also hit three cars. Which brings me to my most important advertising lesson, don't text and drive, okay? If you take nothing out of today, I don't care about any lessons. If you take nothing, I just don't text and drive. It ain't worth it. It's not worth it. It's very stupid. So it really sucked. That's what happened. Um, I was sitting there in the street, and uh, that was the moment when I can identify when everything started to turn. As you guys all know, advertising is a very cyclical business, and things can turn on a dime. And it was shortly after that moment when uh, our largest client in the Chicago office went into review. And now I needed new leadership. And I pretty much decided right then and there with my car steaming and standing in the street that I couldn't do this. I had to turn around and go back. Uh, and that actually leads me to another uh, lesson that I've learned actually uh, many, many, many times over the years. And that is um, that life is short, work for great people. Okay? I know it sounds trite, but I happen to work for an amazing bunch of people um, who wouldn't let me do that. They wanted to honor their commitment um, to me and, and to this project. And so what we did was we worked long distance. Uh, I worked with the New York office as well, and we put new leadership in a place. We doubled down on the businesses we had because we didn't want anything going there, and we tripled down on the business that went into review because we really wanted to retain it. So even though, um, even though uh, you know, um, a lot of my first month of production was eaten up by a lot of long distance work and a lot of long distance management. Uh, their commitment and their help actually saved me four months of completely sleepless nights, um, except for this thing. Now, because there's no way to sleep through that. Um, so, so anyway, we're going to make the movie. We had had the commitment. Let's get on to some of the fun stuff. Let's talk a little bit about casting. Now, another thing I was very fortunate at during my comedy and my performance days in Chicago, I had become very good friends uh, with an actor who had just spent the last seven seasons as the office punching bag on the hit TV show Parks and Recreation, and that's Jim O'Hare. I don't know if people, some people may be familiar with the show, some not. It's a very popular show in the U.S., and now that it's gone to Netflix, it's exploded. Well, Jim played a supporting character on, on that show, and he was freaking out now because the show had come to an end, and he didn't know what he was going to do. He didn't know what he was going to do next. And Chris Pratt and Aziz had gone off to do all these other things, and he's like, what am I going to do next? And the timing was good. I came to him with this part that was unlike anything that he had ever um, had, had before. So he was all in. He was on board. And then we're thinking, all right, for the rest of the cast, we're just going to grab whoever we can because you know, we don't have any money. Um, and I don't know if you know this, but like for a, for a low budget feature or for an ultra low budget feature, you're paying actors just 100 to 125 dollars a day. That's all they get. So I'm thinking, you know, we're going to have to use my mother and my sister in this thing. Well, Jim, Jim is like committed. He's like, no, actors want great parts. They just want to they want to act. They want great parts. It's not always about the money. And if we can get the script out there, we can get we can get some great um, people for that. And that's really what we did. Um, and with that, we, we actually managed to attract some great people. Are there any, any Walking Dead fans here? Anybody know The Walking Dead? Okay, so the first couple of guys we got from The Walking Dead, Andrew J. West played Gareth the Cannibal from Terminus, and uh, Josh McDermott is currently playing Eugene on that show, and so he's on that. We managed to pick up Annie Dudek, and she was a regular on Mad Men and on House and on Big Love. And then Tracy Walter is just an old-time um, actor. He's been around Hollywood forever. He's been in every Jack Nicholson movie. He was in Silence of the Lambs. Most people know him as uh, from the cult classic Repo Man, where he played, um, he played Miller the Mechanic. So, you know, we had all these great actors. We finally had locations, all right? So here's what you come for. Let's get into a little of the rock throwing, shall we? Now, I won't, I won't go through every disaster that happened over the course of, of, of this film because we would be here all afternoon. Um, but what I thought I'd do is I'd take you through a through, few of the, you know, the pain points as they were and the few of the disasters that happened and talk to you a little bit about how my, my lessons, my 30 years in advertising kind of got me through them. And the first one uh, is, this, is this baby here. Um, this is a 1953 Olds 88. Now, this, um, this car was in just about every shot of the film. And at first, we didn't know we were going to find a car like this. All we knew is the script called for 
the script called for um, a really old vintage car that had a really giant trunk that you could stuff a lot of dead bodies into. Always important in any film, as far as I'm concerned. So we had, um, and, and we didn't really know where, we stumbled upon this car, it was in a lot in LA, and I think we picked it up for eight or nine grand, and we used it for this teaser that we went out to shoot. Now that was another thing, for Kickstarter, we went out to shoot a teaser and a trailer ahead of time for a couple reasons. One, we wanted to get our, our feet wet on the production side. But two, we also, on Kickstarter, we wanted to show people the level of quality of, of what, we were, um, what we were shooting for. And this car performed like a dream on, on teaser day. I mean, we were driving it up and down the highway, we were driving it into the desert, we are driving it through shrubs, and it performed great. So when the first day of the shoot comes around, we're excited, we're confident, because we've got this, this great car. And the first day of the shoot is all about driving. Um, the first day was, uh, the scene was Jim's character and Andrew's character. They're basically driving all over this desert town trying to get rid of this dead body, all right? And they're driving all around, driving, driving. They go here, they go there. They go to the hardware store. They can't get, they get tools. They go out to the desert to try and bury the body. They unbury the body. So uh, we're driving everywhere. And the thing that's really important here is, you know, when you're doing a commercial shoot, what do you get? You, you, you get what, maybe eight, 10, 12 setups a day. That's what you're hoping for. For this film, every day, we were shooting 30 to 35 setups. So um, there's no room for error. We barely did second takes. When we were doing dialogue, we did second takes, but we barely did anything. We were shooting and going, shooting and going. So there's no room for error. But we're not worried about it, right? Because we've got this miracle car that we know performs great. And so the first day of the shoot, comes around and we're in the middle of the desert, you know, and it's about 110 degrees. It's, a, it's just as bad as it's been outside for the last four days. So we're, we're out in the middle of the desert and the trailer rolls up with the car sort of under, under cloth, you know, and we unveil the car and the whole crew just starts applauding. Everybody's so excited, right? And then we back the car off. We just kind of roll the car down and Jim comes in and Jim hops into the passenger in the driver's seat and he cranks the engine and boom, it starts right up and everybody applauds, everybody's so happy and I call action, you know, because I'm so happy and the crew starts applauding and we're all so excited and Jim's so happy he honks the horn and when he honks the horn, the entire engine bursts into flames. <laughs> See, we had never honked the horn before <laughs> and apparently the horn lines were crossed with the gas line and so first day, first shot of the day, we're in the middle of the desert, car's on fire. So what do you do? Um, normally in Hollywood, you shut the production down, you figure something else out, and that's what the production crew wanted to do. We wanted to shut the production down, and we said, we'll have to come back and figure it out. Now, the thing I had learned over the years in advertising is that unlike Hollywood in advertising, there are no reshoots in life, at least none that the client is going to pay for. And you got to get everything you can on, you know that, everything you can on that shoot day because that director and that production company, they're going to move on to something else. And if you don't get what you need, you're going to be sitting in the edit room with a world of hurt. So I knew we had to get the day somehow. So what do we do? We threw a blanket over the engine, put it out as best we can, close the engine down, and then we pushed the car into every shot that day. We pushed it up the street, we pushed it down the highway, we pushed it up the hill, we pushed it down the hill, we pushed it in the hardware store, we pushed it into the gas stations, we pushed it into the junkyard, pushed it in the desert, and not the PAs. This was the producers and me. Call action, run and push the car. Call action, push the car. Um, 14 hours a day of that, uh, but we got the day. And you saw some of the footage actually earlier on, you would never know the car wasn't running. In fact, the car was smoking probably through more of this thing than it was running. But we managed to get the day, which sort of proved that out. So anyway, so there's a little something to think about. Next time, you know, you're, you're coming off your hard day of shooting and you're, you know, you're at the Four Seasons sitting poolside and you can barely drift, you know, lift your gin and tonic. You're so tired. You know, think about that one. Think about that one. Um, how about another rock? This, this rock here was called Josh McDermott. And I, I should actually say Josh McDermott's schedule because Josh was a great guy, and Josh really wanted to do this part. It was very different than anything that he had done for Walking Dead. Um, the part he was playing in the film was this just hateful, misogynistic, mean-spirited comic, very much like an Andrew Dice Clay, just very angry, and Josh really wanted to do it. Uh, the problem was he was shooting Walking Dead um, down in Atlanta, and we knew we needed five days from Josh. That's what we needed. We needed two days from him in the desert location, 
We needed two days for, uh, from him in, uh, in the comedy clubs. And then we needed one day from him in the most important scene, which takes place in the motel room at the end where we reveal and you recognize Josh as a dead body in the, I hope I didn't ruin the movie for everybody. I probably, that's, yeah, that's, that's what happened. So, but it's really important. You need to recognize him as this dead body at the end. So, um, Walking Dead is great. They worked it out first. They gave us five days, but there was no flexibility, which would have been fine. But the first day uh, we go to shoot, the day before we go to shoot Josh on that first day, we go out to tech scout our desert location, which is where we're going to be. It's like a diner in the desert. And we get there, and HBO is in our location. Is anyone here from HBO? Okay, because I'm going to talk to you afterwards. Um, HBO is in our location, and we're like, well, what are you doing here, HBO? This is our location. We have paperwork and everything, and we need this location to shoot tomorrow because we only have five days with Josh, and if we don't shoot tomorrow, we have to move the schedule, and we can't move the schedule because then we, we'd have to cut the last day, and we need two days of him in the desert and two days with him in, 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 in the comedy club, and then one day with him in, the, in, in revealing him at the end in the, in the motel. What are, we, we need this day. We have to shoot tomorrow. And HBO, they were like, is somebody talking? It, it, it sounds like somebody's talking. It was, it was absolutely the most helpless I've ever felt in my entire life. Um, because, you know, normally in, um, in advertising, you've got, you've got the client, you've got money, and you can swing the, some power around. And here we had nothing. We were going to move the day. So we were like, well, what are we going to do? You know, we have to recast. We can't even shoot Josh now. We've got to recast the thing. We can't use him because we, we need to recognize him. And then we decided, well, what if we embrace the problem? And what if we didn't need to recognize Josh in that last scene? Um, what if we just blew his head off? So that's what we did. We blew Josh's head off. Now, what was nice about that is, you know, now we didn't need Josh in that last scene. We could use a dummy. Okay, so we could use Dummy Josh. Now, Dummy Josh was awesome for a couple of reasons. One is when my daughters came out to visit me on the set, it was a lot of fun to drive around with headless Josh. <laughs> and also, Josh helped me out a lot because in the mornings, I would drive with him in the carpool lane so I could get to the shoot on time, which was good for me, and I'm sure very helpful to the people around me in the other lanes. Um, now, 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 that solution came from uh, something I'd learned. Uh, it's an old advertising saying that you guys are probably uh, familiar with, and it's the notion of if you can't fix it, feature it. We've all worked on those crappy products that have bad feature points and bad product uh, points of difference and things like that, and you spend your whole time trying to avoid that and not, and then finally you just throw your arms around and embrace the problem and bring it to life, and that's what we did. And so I'll encourage you guys to, as you go forward, there's a different spin on it, you know, when you have that, when you're working on that kind of crappy product and it's not working and things just don't seem to be going right, think about blowing the product's head off. Think about blowing the product's head off. See if that kind of helps, helps jigger it a little bit. Um, do you guys want to hear one more story? Do I have time for one more? Yeah. Okay. All right. One, yeah. one more terror of horror. horror. I'm, I'm having flashbacks it's like Vietnam. I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing all the pain again. Um, this, this rock is called rain. Uh, and stupidly, we wanted to shoot a rain day on this low budget, this ultra low budget feature. And um, this is a scene where Jim, Jim's character pitch, picks up the hitchhiker. And I wanted it to be really dark and creepy and rainy. You know, and normally to shoot a rain sequence in a car and dialogue in a car, you put, you put the car up on a trailer, right? And then you tow, the, you tow that truck with, a, with another truck, a camera car, and you shoot into the, into the car shooting dialogue. And then you chase both of them with a water truck shooting thousands of gallons of water into the air and down. And then you can shoot dialogue safely and it all works out. Well, um, unfortunately, that would have been our entire budget right there. We didn't have that. So we had to do it the Roger Corman way. So, which is, you park the car in a dark location, you get a couple of PAs pushing on the front of the back of the car to jiggle it, and then you get a guy with a hose spraying water on the windshield and down the side, so it looks like the car's moving forward in the rain. Seems simple enough, right? So it's gonna work, great. And it would have worked fine, except for one guy. And there's always one guy on a shoot. 
I don't care if you're on the best production in the world, you know it, there's always one guy on the shoot who's not gonna do it right and is gonna ruin it. And it's, I mean, it could be the prop master, it could be the producer, it could be the director, it could be the agency, you never know, but there's always one guy. And this one guy was the guy in charge of the rain effect. And he was ridiculous because he was dressed like the Gordon's fisherman, you know, he had on a yellow raincoat and yellow rain pants and a yellow rain hat. And he would stand outside the car with the hose, spraying it on it, and he'd be lecturing us on the proper Hollywood technique of spraying water on a windshield, right? And we're sitting in the back of the car. The two actors are catching pneumonia. They're completely soaked. I'm in the back with the sound guy and the DP. And this goes on for hours. We can't get anything because it doesn't look right. And he's standing there lecturing us and talking about the Hollywood technique. And I'm in the back and I go, well, that's great, dude. But all it looks like is you're, it looks like somebody's just running a hose on the windshield. Not to mention the only thing that I can see in every shot is a reflection of some jackass in a yellow raincoat. Okay? So this goes on for hours. And it was the only time I really didn't think we were going to get anything. Um, and the producers wanted to shut it down and said, we'll try it tomorrow without rain, we can't do it. And I just lost it. I said, I said, we can't do that. And I got out of the car and I grabbed the hose. Now, the hose guy, Mr. Fisherman, got very upset with me because apparently I'm not a union hose guy. So he, he, he walks off and leaves me there. So now I'm directing the scene from outside, which is fine because I'm gonna start spraying not the way Hollywood taught me, but the way my father taught me. You put your thumb over the nozzle and you get a nice spray, okay? So, um, so we get that going, and, the, and it, the scene worked out great. We finally get it looking great, and the scene wor worked out great inside the car, except the only problem was I'm now outside underneath the rain towers completely soaking, and the water's completely kicking back and soaking me, and I happen to be wearing electronic headphones, which don't work in water very well, so I'm basically being electrocuted every 15 seconds. So um, the scene worked out great. You see it, you'd never know there was a problem, but if you look at the outtakes, it sounds like there's, uh, there's a man with Tourette syndrome outside the car who's like every 15 seconds, it's like, shit, 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 shit. <laughs> so I barely, we barely got the dialogue we needed. But that brings me to my, sort of my favorite lesson I've learned over the years, um, which is always good, is the notion of never be afraid to look like an idiot to protect your ideas. I don't care whether it's the biggest production you've ever been on or the smallest tweet or the smallest post. Never be afraid of what you look like getting your ideas. You don't have to be a jerk about it. Uh, I tried not to be a jerk about it, but you don't have to be a jerk about it. But get in there and get, if that director's not giving you what you need, you're not gonna get a second chance later. You can apologize to your boss all you want later. Get in there and, and get what you need. Um, so anyway, um, I think that's enough pain for me for one. That's enough rocks for, uh, for one day. Um, the point was there were a hundred other stories like that um, that actually made for a better feature in, our, in the way we worked, the way we worked through it. Um, we did manage to make a feature. People ask sort of what happened after that. Well, from, the, from a film standpoint, um, we actually spent the better part of last year going around to the festivals and we did very well. We actually won a bunch of festivals. We won a bunch of award shows. And, um, and we thought that was going to be it. And uh, to, our, to our surprise and our delight, um, just two, two weeks ago, actually, we had a national theatrical release in the U.S. into six major markets, uh, which was a miracle through AMC Films. And we got great reviews all the way around, except for Hollywood. Except for Hollywood. Um, but it was great, and it was a great experience. And what happened back at work? Well. I, I have to say I work for a, an amazing and tenacious bunch of people and uh, we put new leadership into place, we doubled down on the business, none of the other business was at risk, and the business that we had tripled down on, um, we managed to, to rescue that piece of business, we managed to, to keep that piece of business that was up, up for review. And then when I got back, um, the entire network, uh, from New York to Chicago to San Francisco, we worked like dogs pitching new business and over the last two years, we managed to pick up a couple of large pieces of business along the way, and we were fortunate enough um, just last, at the end of last year, to uh, have Ad Age award us Comeback Agency of the Year. So, um, you know what? Um, thank you. Yeah. Uh, that felt pretty good. So, you know, I guess, I guess good things can come out of great tragedy um, with a lot of hard work. Um, so, really, um, that's it, I'm not, I, you know, and I'm not advocating for everybody here to go quit your job tomorrow, and I certainly don't think you should go take a four paid unpaid leave, four, four month unpaid leave like I did, or go do something stupid. But I am saying that there will come a time in your life 
when you can have the chance and go do it. Go do something terrifying. Do something terrifying. Don't just put yourself out of your comfort zone. Do something that completely terrifies you because the fact of the matter is the only reason it terrifies you might be because you've never done it before. And the, and, and the prospect of not doing that thing, well, that should be the thing that really scares you. Um, so with that, I just want to say thank you for hearing my story and, and having me here. I'm going to leave you with one, um, one sort of last thought before I go. A lot of people ask me how I felt, um, you know, in one word, kind of what was the feeling you had um, doing this, what was accomplishing this sort of thing. And what I come back to a lot there, like, did you, was it triumphant? Was it victorious? And the word I often come up with is, is humbling. I found the entire experience completely humbling um, for a couple of reasons. One, humbling because of the amazing group of people back at work and my family who supported this. Humbling because of the hundreds and hundreds of people who came out, you know, people who gave us, strangers who gave us money on Kickstarter and people who donated their time and their talent and their energies. Um, special effect people, post-production people who are here, editors, um, special effects uh, folks, musicians who gave us it, but mostly, Mostly I found it humbling and mostly to this very day I still find it humbling because even after two years, I'll still come back after a long day of work and I'll open up my email and I still get a couple of these. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Big round of applause, please, for Ned Crowley. Thank you, man. Thank you. Okay, so that wasn't a bad way to start the day, was it? Did you enjoy that? Excellent. There's plenty more like that to come later today. We're going to take a short break now, but we'll be back in 15 minutes uh, with uh, world-renowned photographer Platon and TBWA. We'll see you in 15 minutes. Thank you.